Okay, hello. Welcome to another Enigmas of the Ancient World video. My name's Luke. Today's video is going to be at Karnak Temple in Luxor, Egypt. Before we start, I'd like to thank Matt over at Ancient Architects, who uh, gave me a plug, I think, in one of his videos. And I, I got a bunch of subscribers from that, and I very much appreciate that, Matt. Also, congratulations on getting one of your theories in the Daily Express. Uh, well done. Keep it up. So here we are at Karnak, um, on the ram-headed Sphinx Road, heading into the uh, unfinished pylon, which was built by Nectanebo in the 30th Dynasty. This, uh, this Sphinx Avenue was built, I think, in the 11th Dynasty. Uh, up to the 10th Dynasty, uh, Karnak Temple used to be one of four temples in the Amorite District that worshipped uh, the Het Bull, the Apis Bull. And then that switched around the 10th Dynasty to 11th Dynasty when they worshipped Montu, who was a bird-headed Netter. And then as Ares became dominant in the night sky uh, in the 11th Dynasty, it became uh, Ares and Kunum and Atom, uh, as we saw there, between the paws of Kunum. So this is the, the last pylon, 30th Dynasty, built by Nectanebo. Yes, sir. These are the ram roads, like the one we saw drawn in the wall. Right. In the tomb of Rahma. Look at the size of the block. Look at the material. Yeah. And this is how the dynastic Egyptians used to build their stone structures. No scaffolds, but the ram road from Madrid. So, I mean, it's a very basic uh, premise. I'll actually take you to the tomb of Rachmara and show you that stuff in a second. But you can see uh, the Middle and Late Kingdoms is a very common building technique. You can see one pillar that is unfinished. Oh, yeah. How they build it from sections, and then how they smooth it later to be with the rest of the shapes. Like right. The traditional manual way of building structures. Which is, of course, not what everything we're going to see here is made that way. And indeed, let's go to the tomb of Rekhmara and the, the tomb of the nobles and, and look at uh, the description and the technique. That's the Ramesseum, by the way, another place that we go on the October tour uh, that you're welcome to join us for. I'll have a little plug for that at the, the end of the video. And uh, so this is uh, Tombs of Nobles, the Tomb of Rachmara. And I will have to kill uh, the sound in here at some point because people start toning and it just it blows everything out um, in my tiny little microphone. For those of you who don't know and who complain, there's one guy in particular who complains about the microphone in these videos and the sound. There's no microphone permission in Egypt. Uh, every time I've tried to set up a real microphone, I get swamped by security dudes who are like, you can't have that. Where's your permission? There is no permission. So what you're stuck with is this little microphone. Okay, I've wasted enough time on that. So this uh, looks like uh, that Nalus box, uh, every temple, and also the one at Elephantini Island. It's the same uh, outer design, except it hasn't been hollowed out. They've just uh, carved this sort of uh, receding doorway design into it and made... Uh, Obviously, what is referred to as the false door, the Ka door. And uh, it looks like it reflects light. That's actually paint. Um, but it, it, it does have a, a strange kind of light. It almost feels like, like a burnished metal, but it's not. So I'm going to let Yusuf explain here until the sound quality gets too bad, and then I'll, I'll take over. So they will do the mud break in that section. These are the stones, the pillars, that they are building. So they will raise the ram road until this level. First, of course, they can drag these to their locations on the bedrock after they prepare the foundation. And then they can fill the entire structure with mud break, like what you see is filling between the blocks. And then they drag the other course of stones to the next level. So that's essentially it. It's very simple. They just build the first level up and then build a, a ramp of mud brick up to the top of that level and then start using that as the base to build the second level. And then once they've finished, uh, you can see the multi-level columns there. Once they finish at the top, um, as they remove the mud bricks, that's when they uh, shape and decorate. And that explains a lot of the stuff that we see at Karnak and other places, especially Middle Kingdom, 
uh, and later how they built this stuff. Of course, there's no depictions of how they built uh, the pyramids. And I'm not actually talking about even just the Great Pyramids, but also uh, Saqqara, uh, the Step Pyramid of Zoser, the first stone building of any note in the entire world. Uh, there's no depiction of that. Uh, Sneferu's pyramids, there's no depiction of those, as well as the Great Pyramids. So it's it's not just one, it's really all of the, the megalithic old stuff is not accounted for, including the Sphinx. And here is a, a beautiful Sphinx, actually. It's got some vitrification on it. It still has uh, a, nice, a nice finish to it in some places that aren't broken. Really just beautiful work that's been salvaged. So these are some tool marks that Yusuf was pointing out on uh, this alabaster piece, which is probably um, a pedestal. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know Yusuf likes to talk about uh, the different types of stone, uh, whether they um, insulate or whether they conduct electromagnetic energy. These are mutts, uh, but not segment. Segment always stands. As I showed you some of the, that this design yeah. is not just a flower, it's the symbol of the nipple that represent feeding. Um, yeah, in the, in the Akhenaten room, in the Cairo Museum, the queen yeah. has the same... Uh, yes, and also you can see it in the, sometimes the wig of the goddess uh, Hathor, is, mm. is all full of that, so she, it's all about feeding. connection to the source through the mother nourishment and uh, yes yeah, so before we get into this next part I want to talk about the book of the gates for a second uh, the book of the gates and uh, actually the book of the duat is much more interesting than the book of the dead um, which just has a more more interesting name these uh, what we're looking at here is a symbol that looks like a lava lamp on its side with a little circle um, these are always around dimensional gateways gateways uh, that the pharaoh or the deceased would have to pass through before he would face the next task or uh, be judged in some way or need to defeat uh, an entity. And uh, that's the symbol. You see them around gates all the time. So we entered this little red chapel, which I was unaware of its existence. And the first thing I notice is this basin with the gateway symbol all around it. And then as I'm looking, I see these uh, incredible gateways and also Yusuf Oyen, International Megalithic Man of Mystery. Uh, but anyway, I see these incredible uh, granite, granodiorite doorways, uh, multi-piece, but really incredibly machined and interlocking. We'll go and look at the one in the back here in a second. And the redstone is quartzite, the original redstone. And this has been reassembled and put back together, and Egyptologists don't really know what this is for. But look at the gateway symbol. It's on the stones all the way around the base. It's on the stone around this pedestal right here. Got a very interesting pedestal right there with uh, some kind of fluid that would come out and go under this doorway and under those stairs. You have something that looks like it swung in to that and locked in this part. Um, if you've been to Oyente Tambo and seen some of those doors at the temple at the top, you'll notice these are kind of put together in a similar fashion the way they're cut. What this slot is for, I don't know, but I think something slotted into there and came out as it was rolled through the grooves at the bottom. You've got tube drills for hinges. This is granodiorite. This is absolutely massive. They've reassembled this at some point. They don't really know much about these temples. They were destroyed. It has the gateway symbol all the way through it. So what did the Egyptologists say? Ah, uh, it's for LARPing. Live action role playing. Uh, the priests would make a little model of the solar boat and they'd put it on that pedestal symbolizing going through the gateway and then they would walk it to the next temple so either you believe that they were larping in this temple or perhaps there was something else going on i don't know so here we're looking at a, a tool mark in the uh, groove there the center the corner inner corner it goes all the way up in there it's just one tool mark not a chisel kind of interesting you see that a lot and these hieroglyphs in this uh, white temple some of the most detailed hieroglyphs uh, in all of Egypt. 
Maybe only the Crypt of Dendera is quite as detailed and as nice. Look at the door. Look at the, the locks on the door, as well as all that sort of cross-hatching. Just beautiful. So back out into the uh, Hippostyle hallways, the open, open museum of Karnak, as they call it, and uh, here are the sectioned columns. So now we know how those were built. We just saw that, and... It's very interesting. There's not much mystery to it, but the, what it produces is still magnificent. And if you can imagine coming in, you know, from the, from the desert, from maybe your little village where you've lived with the goats all your life, and you come in and this is the city and the big temple here, and this is all painted, multi-level, megalithic, just must have been absolutely mind-blowing uh, for travelers and natives alike. It's still mind-blowing now. And uh, so you can only imagine what it must have been back then, when this was just beyond what you know, many civilizations had been able to accomplish, that we remember anyway. There's an excellent book on Karnak Temple called Temples of Karnak by R.A. Schwala de Lubitsch, and I highly recommend it. It has some beautiful, detailed black-and-white photographs, as well as many descriptions and untanglings of the esoteric meanings of the ancient Egyptians, and his work inspired and informed John Anthony West, whose work inspired and informed Grant Hancock, whose work inspired and informed me, and I'm sure most of you watching this video. Uh, so uh, it's really worth checking out all of Ari Schwalder Lubitsch's books, actually. And here's uh, Hatshepsut's obelisk. Um, that's her writing in the middle and Tutmosis on the sides. This is the largest uh, freestanding obelisk still in Egypt today. And it's one piece, weighs just over 400 tons uh, from red granite. And if you remember, if you saw my uh, Aswan Quarry video, you'll remember how supposedly the official story for the unfinished obelisk is it broke as they were cutting it and Hatshepsut it. I said, come on guys, let's get real. This is embarrassing. Only normal size obelisk from now on and so this is what they came up with and they never again tried to build a larger obelisk so that's the story and they're sticking to it and now it's the largest you grill ever found oh my god oh, uh, that one of course oh, so you can see that the edge going deeper, which shows that this was carved by tube drill with the same lines that we have seen in the pyramid structures. Wow. So there is a layer here that goes back to the same era of the pyramid builders. We can see the same result, the same combination of stones. Even if it was recycled more than once, still we can see the things. If you complete the circle, it will be more than 20 centimeters wide. Oh, a little bit more than 20 centimeters, I think. Or around 20 centimeters. But if you look at the edge here, it's very thin. See yeah. that? Yeah. This is how thick the blade was. So imagine a tubular drill that is this big and the blade of it is that thin. It's capable of cutting granite stone with that smooth surface. And it is really smooth. The darker parts are the smoothest, but all of it is really, really smooth. And uh, I, I've had several friends uh, message me who use, uh, who are machinists and who use uh, cutting tools today who said that their saws cannot be that thin to cut through stone, granite stone, like that today. So I can only imagine what the ancient Egyptians had, had figured out. And I'm just, I'm blown away by the size of this. I don't care what Freud has to say. Most of these tube drills are, uh, you know, usually like a soup can. Some of them are, are quite small, like a flashlight maybe, um, or a Sharpie. Uh, but most of them are about the size of a soup can, and then there's this one, which is like a, a, a can of paint, like just unbelievable. There are a lot of other tube drills at um, Karnak. Most of them are for hinges in the older megalithic uh, doorways. Um, and if you, 
you know, if you look, you will see them everywhere. Once you start looking for them, they're, they're everywhere. And then there's this, the Holy of Holies, just similar to some of the other Holy Holies, Holy of Holies at uh, the old temples, Edfu, Komombo, etc. Um, this is what Yusuf calls transformed granite. It is granite that has undergone some kind of event that has rendered that surface just melty and smooth and it's broken over on this side but even some of the interior parts of that as you can see are also melty and smooth to use the technical terms this is it's set on a matching box which i don't know if was the original box but there is um uh, a cavity in there and i i don't know if it's that's what it's been set on or if that was part of the original piece uh, so recently in the, the news, I was looking at this Namibian uh, meteorite, and I, as I first looked at it, I, it reminded me of the top of this stone. And then as I looked at it again, I went, no, look how red that is. That's all iron content, and this is not like that. This is, this is granite, so it just looks like it's been subjected to entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and if you watch, it's just people are drawn to this. They just want to rub it. Everybody who, who comes past this has to uh, spend a little time rubbing it. But definitely some kind of uh, heat event is all I can imagine. Uh, unless, again, it, some kind of smoothing liquid that they spilled everywhere after it broke. I don't know. I don't know what this is. But it's heavily vitrified. It's even more vitrified than some of the, the stuff in Cuzco uh, inside the temples. The little cave temples that they have there. Before we leave this room, let's have a look at the ceiling. Uh, it's a very massively megalithic ceiling. Uh, you can still see some of the blue paint and the stars. There's actually that gateway symbol at the very top around that center area as well. You can see the double layer and the hieroglyphs on the side here, very blue-green, which may suggest that they actually had copper inserts that have oxidized tube drill marks there for hinges in the doorway. And then as you come out, look at these uh, beautiful palm, uh, high-relief palms on the inside of those columns. Just amazing and uh, always stunning today, but how stunning was it thousands of years ago? So these are, these are cartouches of, of the kings who did renovation at this site? Yeah. And we have Senefru's name? We have Senefru's name, the first name up there. The one to the left? Yeah. You have Sahura. The second one, here you have Nusra. No, no, no. Yes. So that he's sixth dynasty. No, Khibarra. And all the way until very modern names, actually. Until Nechtenibu. From the 30s dynasty. So he, they wrote a, uh, all the kings this of those who renovated the site. We have the names from the Middle Kingdom here in Tif, but the cartouche is not complete. This, this part, this very important part should be actually isolated because we can see that it's flaking and it's not in a good condition. So it should be preserved. Like this part should be something that is built from glass around it to save this. Right. So of course it was written in the modern times, but it's a list of those who renovated the site from the time of Senefru, like the first dynasty. That means there was already here a structure, and this structure went wrong, and then they came to renovate it. So, repairs being done in the fourth dynasty. You don't repair anything new. So this is the fallen uh, obelisk, and... Uh, made out of red granite and you can see just how even and beautiful that is and if you slap your hand towards the tip uh, the whole thing will ring like a bell uh, it's so resonant the granite is so resonant here's another another pylon with the crane behind it I bet the Egyptians wish they had a crane and just so many beautiful little temples here you can go into, and some still have really uh, 
surprisingly high amount of, of paint and color still on the walls. That Egyptian blue, the first culture to really discover how to create blue as a, an artistic color. It's pretty impressive. Okay, we're going to take a, a look at a really interesting tool mark in this stairway on the way down, but you'll notice here there's the walls here are just covered with black soot or something, some kind of material. It's a very rudimentary uh, hieroglyphs in the wall. This staircase right that we're working on right now has been repaired. And we weren't really allowed in here. They let us in here to take a quick look, and as soon as I got up to take a 360, I was, I was told I was going to get everybody in trouble, so I didn't really get the full glorious 360, so this will have to do. But you can see the absolute overwhelming size of this site. Yusuf and I spent a couple of hours down in, in the rubble field, but we could have spent months easily. You could spend a lifetime in Egypt and, and just not really get to everything. So as we go down, take a look here. Right behind Yusuf, you'll see a couple of uh, keystone cuts there holding the stairs. The old stairs in place, and again this black funk everywhere. And then as I pan right and down, you'll hear me say, wow. wow. And what I've just seen is this tool mark right in front of us. Uh, there's two of them. There's one that looks like a mistake or a slip, and then just that large deep semicircular cut. The upper part is hard to tell is recessed about an inch behind the lower part. And I don't know how deep that is, but it looks quite deep. And I, I don't know the purpose of that and I don't know the tool that did that. Uh, that's something we're going to look at in closer in October. I get a, a, a really good flashlight up there and a zoom and uh, check that out. I want to I know more about that. That we find here. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. And it's so, about the same kind of fine lines like here. It's like there. So my question as a stone carver, why they didn't use the tools that they made these fine details with here to do the writings? The writings are never as good as the artwork and detail on the actual object. This is conglomerate. You can see the flint, and I want you to come and feel how smooth this is, look. This is part of the skirt, of course, the dress. Oh, that's really smooth. Mm. That's, yeah. In a very rough type of stone. Coarse e design. Even like the flint part is smooth. Exactly. That's very impressive. So there is a difference between the fine details in the art and the fine details in the item. And this is back in the Red Chapel again. So they were not able to shape the same good parts like over here. Hmm? Yeah. And over here. And over here. Every part of the details that hit one of them flints, it was not completed with the same sharpness. And just ignore uh, that sperm coming from the star. Just ignore that. You didn't see that. Overwritten. Oh, yeah. Over the, uh, over the necklace. Over the necklace, yes. So once you start uh, to realize this, you see how much of writings were added on top of all their things. Yeah. As I told you in the beginning, we have overwhelming amount. Yeah. It's not like one piece or two or ten. It's again and again and again. So here you can see uh, how resonant granite can be. If I get my little microphone down a little closer. And that's what that column sounds like when you smack it. It's almost like it's hollow. So these uh, groove marks, you see these all over the world. Uh, there's some actually in Nectanebo's pylon here too, really deep ones. It's an interesting, you know, it looks like somebody's been sharpening a tool. 
And of course, these uh, keystone cuts. A lot of people put a lot of importance into keystone cuts, but in Egypt, uh, I don't find them to be too exciting. And that's because that magical fourth dynasty where they were able to do anything in any stone they wanted, no matter how large it was. You know, they fit together these pieces like jigsaw puzzles, um, and they didn't need any keystone cuts. Everything was perfect. So this is later in Egypt. It's a Middle Kingdom and later technique. And in fact, look at this picture. You can see that recycled piece has hieroglyphs on the inside facing towards the inside of the next piece. So that's, that's later on. You know, it's a later technique. Uh, the perfect fourth dynasty. They didn't need any of that stuff. This is the Temple of Sekhmet. Uh, if you're lucky, you can find someone with some keys to let you in to poke around. Uh, there's some uh, reused tables uh, that are quite interesting in there. And uh, the alcoves are kind of remind me of the Saqqara Sound Hospital. And inside uh, the temple, there are three rooms. There's this first room that has the headless statue of Ptah. The room on the left is empty. And the room on the right has uh, this statue of Sekhmet. Um, probably almost seven feet, including the sun disk uh, on top, and it looks like it's made out of some kind of breccia. It's uh, it's in its porphyritic. It's got all those chunks of other stone in it that make it difficult to cut. But a beautiful statue. And so these are some of the other uh, tool marks you'll run into all over the ancient sites in Egypt, but here particularly at Karnak, uh, these kind of saw marks. And then this is not my photograph. Somebody submitted this on my website. That center cut and the one on the left, you can, you can see there's a really narrow cut that started that that's gone the whole way. Even though it's a bit wonky there, it's gone the whole way up, the entire length of that. And when you look at the tool mark, again, this isn't my photo. I'll get high definition of this stuff in October. Look at how narrow that blade is, how thin the blade is at the bottom of the cut. Just along that whole massive piece. It's ridiculous. So this, what is this mud brick I see here before me? I hear you say, um, this isn't mud brick. This isn't mud. This is granite. This is really, really old granite. This is behind the Holy of Holies. And again, earlier when we were talking about repairs being done in the 4th Dynasty, this stuff looks older than 4th Dynasty even. This is, may have been some of the original original building from way, way back, or the original building supplies. Because this is, I've never seen granite that's obviously high quality granite that has just decayed to that level. It's not like that poor quality surface granite in the Aswan video. So another uh, beautiful hieroglyphic scene on the hypostyle walls. Really, uh, I love this stuff. And I, again, I recommend R.A. Schwaller to Lubitsch's book, Temples of Karnak. Okay, well that was Karnak Temple, and this is my upcoming tour with Yusuf Oyen and also Danny Kerr from Tesla Pyramids going to come with us. We have a slew of special permissions to go inside sites and parts of sites that are normally off access, close the tourists, we will take you there. We will show you the really cool stuff. Uh, so included with the private entrance to the Great Pyramid are all these other fascinating sites. You can check out my website, enigmasoftheancient.world, for all the information on the full itinerary and how to sign up. You can also go to chemitology.com and scroll down for the tour page for the Special Permissions Tour and sign up there. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. I hope to see you in the next video, which will be on the Step Pyramid of the Zoser.